Peter Bryant. Thanks, Rob. Uh, good to be here. Uh, we are very conscious that it's only us standing between you and drinks, so it's always a bad place to be. So we've covered space, we've covered you know, uh, change at a corporate level, uh, capability building, and we've had this notion of company purpose. Um, what we're going to talk about today uh, with this great panel is about change at scale at an industry level. So if you think about changing a company is difficult, think about changing an entire industry and in the way it operates. Um, I want to read a quote from Pascal Lamy, and I'll loop back around after introducing the panel to the significance of this. So Pascal Lamy, and I'll explain who he is later, he said late last year, a good model for change is creative coalitions. So keep that in your mind. So this is a unique panel, and we've done a several firsts actually at uh, Kin Global today. You know, we did the fast uh, flip charts. So this is unique in that we have on this panel an Irishman who lives in Washington, D.C., a Scotsman who lives in Houston, an Australian who lives in London, being facilitated by a New Zealander. Okay? And Rob has difficulty uh, mimicking my accent, because I keep telling him it's a British accent, but I'll leave it to you to figure out who's who uh, as, as we're speaking. So on my immediate right, we have uh, Mark Kudafani, uh, who is CEO of Anglo-American, a 30 uh, plus billion dollar diversified global miner. Uh, next to him is uh, Derek Matheson, Chief Strategy Officer for Baker Hughes, $23 billion oil services company. And on the immediate right, uh, Father Seamus Finn, who is Director of Justice, Peace and Integrity for an order at the Vatican. I do want to actually read out the purpose of his organisation, because I think it's intriguing given the current conversations. It is being present where decisions affecting the lives and futures of the poor are made. So being at the table. And he also is at the epicenter of socially responsible investment. So all of these three individuals are truly visionary, visionary leaders. I've had the opportunity uh, to grow friendships with them and work and collaborate with them over the last few years. So, so before I, I hand over to Mark, just to give you some context. Pascal Lamy, just so you know, is a career civil servant from France. So he's the Trade Commissioner for the European Union. He was the Director General of the World Trade Organization. Um, so he has a fundamental belief in his system for many decades that government was the way to solve intractable problems. Uh, late last year at Oxford University, he came out and said that no longer are governments and international institutions capable of solving intractable issues. And that creative coalitions, including government, need to self-form and self-organize to solve the intractable problems. And that's, in fact, the principles that he issued in those statements is actually what we've done with the Kin Catalyst. Okay, so the Kin Catalyst started about four years ago, and it was conceived as a, to create a platform where we could convene these creative coalitions to tackle what we saw as the intractable issues facing a particular industry. And the first one I'll be asking Mark to uh, tee off is actually the one over the mining. So I don't know if Mark remembers, but four years ago, he and I were speaking, and we're creatures of habit, probably where we're sitting by and large today, in row two here. And we were talking about how the mining industry has this precipitous decline in its social license to operate around the world, and that it's creating massive value destruction. And in Mark's words, that mining was failing society. I mean, these are bold words from a leader within the industry. And from that, we conceived the Kin Catalyst, the mining company of the future. So Mark, why don't you uh, take us on that journey? Um, for those that, that probably don't know, today about $25 billion worth of mining projects have been stopped uh, after they've been committed to by uh, various corporations across the globe. There's probably another five times that number that are in the formative stages of whether they're going through scoping studies, pre-feasibility studies or in fact feasibility studies. The world has enough resources to support the things we do. And I'll give you some statistics. Some of you have already heard, but for those that haven't, I will go back through them. And if we're not able to unlock those resources and actually extract them for use by all of us, then life as we know it, or life as you know it, will not exist on this planet. The mining industry represents, on a direct basis, and I'm talking about as measuring production, about 10% of the world's GDP. It's a bit over 10% of the world's GDP. If we take 
payments to service and support industries and other payments that were involved in, you can take that up to about 20%. It's a bit less than 20%. If we then look at the products from our industry, whether it's fertilisers to the agricultural sector that virtually doubles or more than doubles productivity per area under agriculture, remember that 40% of the world's surface is actually under agricultural being grazed uh, in terms of providing food for all of us. Uh, we take up less than 1% of the Earth's surface in mining. Uh, we produce less than 2.5% of the world's carbon gases and the products of mining actually mean that the industry has a negative carbon footprint. We purify water so that all of us can drink. We purify the emissions from vehicles and we do a whole range of other things that are absolutely critical to ensuring that the world is in fact sustainable. And to think that there is a potential that we will run desperately short of uh, raw materials to produce many of the things that we take for granted today in the next 10 to 20 years is rather frightening. And if we're able to, or if we have to uh, do something different, pay a lot more for the products, then uh, given we make up at least 10% of everything you use, then inflation in our sector literally impacts everybody in this room quite significantly and even more so for those in the poor of the world. In thinking about the problems we were facing, we thought something different was needed to be done. In understanding where we get it wrong as an industry, when I talked about that 1% of the Earth's surface that we disturb, the biggest issue or the biggest impact we have on the lives and people are those that are located next to a mining operation, our local communities. And in most cases, those $25 billion projects are being held up because the mining industry hasn't connected with those local communities. And yes, there are a range of NGOs that are involved in those conversations, but it's the local communities we haven't connected with. In talking about that uh, at a seminar a couple of years ago, in fact, the KIN event down in Brazil, that we talked about innovation, both in terms of technical innovation and social innovation. We happened to come across the conversation about NGOs and those that are funding NGOs, and we happened to touch on the role of the Catholic Church. Catholic Church being, as I understand it, the largest organisation in the world, 1.6 billion people. In many cases, when we get it wrong, and, and we have many examples of getting it desperately wrong, the role of the local priest, the church, the citizens of the church are quite central to the pushback we get as an industry. And by the way, I'm not blaming anyone, I'm just saying, or if I'm blaming, blaming anyone for those issues, I'm looking in the mirror and, and saying it's the mining industry's issue, that we have to change the way we operate. We thought that it would make sense to reach out to the Catholic Church to try and understand what we were missing try and open a dialogue to understand how we might reshape the way our industry leadership understands and thinks about the social development issues and how maybe we could put together a different model that took those points of view into account, change the way we operate and one hopes creates a win-win for everyone in society. So I guess that's where we started. One of the critical issues for us is, as a, as a group, is that I'm also head of the International Council for Mining and Metals and we have 22 of the largest mining companies in that group and there's probably only five or six key members that can see the value of what we're doing and that's one of the biggest challenges we have as an industry. It's generally a fairly conservative industry. So what we're hoping that five or six becomes seven or eight becomes 20 or 30 and we hope that by leading by example that we can drag the rest of the industry along with us in terms of divide, designing and putting in place a new operating model and hopefully be successful and hopefully ultimately be able to support everybody in this room. A, li a final point it was interesting listening to the perspectives from GE today. Uh, one thing I said to Jeffrey Imolt is what are you going to do when you run out of raw materials for the products that you produce, I suspect you might go back into mining. Just a thought. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Derek, uh, you had a, he's going to talk about, he was in a very interesting energy forum, which was sponsored by BP, which actually preceded Kin Global last year.
It was called the Kin Energy Forum, the Future of Unconventional Oil and Gas. And uh, not in a religious or spiritual way, but uh, Derek had an epiphany actually at that uh, session, which actually has resulted in us kicking off the Kin Catalyst for Unconventional Oil and Gas, or as it's popularly known, fracking. Terrible term, um, if you mispronounce it. And uh, we are actually, uh, we had our inaugural exploratory session in Miami in February. We've got another session actually here at the Allen Center in two weeks with a very interesting, diverse, creative coalition. But I'd let, uh, again, Derek kind of walk us through how, you know, the role Baker Hughes has, what his epiphany was, and what we're doing. You know, at every conversation around oil and gas today touches on unconventionals. And as part of unconventionals fracking, but even in this conference it's come up, what, three or four times already, and we've not even been talking about, about fracking energy. Fracking on the moon, right? Right. Yep. The, um, and th there's no doubt it's having you know, an enormous effect on the United States. You know, in, in the last two years, the domestic production has increased by 750,000 barrels a day year over year. And in 2013, net imports for oil decreased by over 10%. You know, something that's just uh, the highest levels in the last 20 years. And no one was imagining that was going to be the case even just five years ago. So, I mean, unconventionals and, you know, oil and gas is in the news for all the right reasons and for all the ro wrong reasons. Now, at the same time that we're discussing all this uh, net positive impact, there's another, you know, series of debates going on today with just the, the deep mistrust there is of our industrial sector. You know, the reputation that we've either you know, created or we've allowed to be built over the last uh, 50 years is something that's really in front of communities, in front of the, the public like no other time before. And you know, I, so the, the, the epiphany Peter's talking about is I, I come prepared with lots of facts and figures last year for the, the, the Kin event. I had a whole morning of, uh, you know, deep emotional, you know, interaction with a, a bunch of very educated people who knew nothing about necessarily my industrial sector and I'm trying to give facts and figures and just halfway through it thinking, this is just all wrong. You know, we're, we're not able to talk to each other. We've no kind of common reference points that are allowing us to actually engage in something that has an outcome associated with it. And I, you know, the, the whole area of language in this area is a, is a, a big piece of, uh, you know, part of the missing link, if you like. And I, I remember thinking afterwards that I was actually in a class of energy as a foreign language. Right? <laughs> Except, you know, I was in the class as well, and there was no curriculum, and there was nobody really teaching it. And so when you look at some of the, the, the big challenges in the whole space of creating impetus for change, sometimes you don't actually have the language to start with. You have a whole range of different people with perspectives and, and opinion, and, you know, the only way you really make some kind of move forward is to create these coalitions in a way that gives you that common frame of reference that allows you to have a dialogue in the, in, in the first place. You know, it was something, and I, I was fortunate enough to be invited to um, you know, piggyback on some of the work that, that Mark had been doing in mining, just to get a feel for what creative coalitions actually look like, and, and met Seamus and a few others, and, and saw the same thing with mining. That people talking in and around the subject with very different perspectives and very passionate about what they want to achieve, but we're talking all the way past each other and trying to find that common ground is a, a big piece off the starting point. You know, so we're, we're at an earlier stage with the, the Ken Catalyst for unconventional oil and gas, but we're already trodden, you know, treading some of the same path uh, that Mark and his team have been. Now, let, let me say something a little bit about scale and complexity here. You know, in the United States, there are, there are around about 10,000 E&P companies, and almost all privately held. And you know, part of the enormous success that, that, that is the story. Uh, EMP stands for Exploration right. and Production. Right. Language. <laughs> yeah, and, and Peter's told me a few times, don't turn up and talk like an energy guy. So I'm, yeah. you know, <laughs> try. <laughs> he's here to translate probably for my, well, and I, I, I talk in an East Texas accent as well, as you've noticed. So <laughs> you know, after, <laughs> any question you can ask Peter. Um, you know, so, the, the scale of what's going on here is unprecedented. And some of these massive numbers and changes in production is not happening with the handful of companies that it used to. So 10,000 companies are you know, small privately owned companies are what's creating this, uh, this, this major change and prosperity for the United States. 
And the, the very nature of that success is actually one of the, you know, the, the huge challenges in front of us today. And if you're trying to create some kind of change at scale to look at you know, really understanding social license to operate and how you might have to interact with communities and suppliers and, and uh, you know, NGOs and all sorts of different way, you know, trying to figure out how to do that with 10,000 companies and all the supply chain associated with it is very different than trying to get the two or three you know, like key movers to, like, to, take that, to take that first step. You know, so we're, you know, we're midway through the process of the enrollment in the space, if you like, where we've had our first conversation and we're, we're setting up to have our second in about two, two weeks' time. And we're already getting some of the, um, you know, what we'd expect, you know, feedback to us in terms of we already have this taken care of. You know, we're already in, engaging with communities. We already have a strategic plan for, like, looking at social license. But it's with a very, very small ecosystem with one or two companies that we, they work for in very small areas or states that they work in and nothing that would necessarily create the, the type of fundamental shift in, in how this should be done at a, either a countrywide or a, or a global level. So there's a, you know, a, a basic you know, belief that most companies are doing things right and doing things the right way. And they, they, they are, it just feels extraordinarily you know, scared to take the step outside of their own companies to look at how they might influence you know, like change I mean, for the industrial sector it's, it, itself. You know, so that, that's a piece of what we're wrestling with today, is how do we carry the, uh, and it's really the search for the missing links. Now we, we believe there's some right things to do to influence what, what should happen in this generation, but how do we make the strategic links back to improving business activities and prosperity in the, in the day to day? And you know, the, I mean the really, you know, I guess interesting thing about this is that we know we don't have the answers. And part of what we're hoping to do with, with these groups is like to take enough time to let the conversation settle and that, that together we try and figure out what some of the deep undercurrents of what needs to happen and what they are and, and from there start working on the, the action plan, if you like, for, for outcomes. And there's, there's an enormous amount of excitement around, we should be doing something. You know, let's move immediately to action, but with something that really is going to take a generation to work through correctly, you know, the, the patience to get through the first year to really study those undercurrents, I think, is going to be the big challenge in the next, uh, next few months. Thanks, Jared. And, and to give you a sense of these creative coalitions and just picking on the unconventional gas, I mean, we're talking about not only the uh, EM exploration and production companies, big suppliers like Baker Hughes, GE in the room. We're talking about people like the National Resource Defence Council and the Environmental Defence Fund in the room. We're talking about First Nation representatives being in the room people that are running uh, from the community being in the room. And it's a very diverse conversation. It's probably a polite way to say it, but they do talk at odds to each other. So it's really interesting. Seamus, uh, really interesting. Uh, I think all of us actually here had the uh, distinct, I think, pleasure and personal experience and professional experience to be hosted by Cardinal Turkson and Seamus at the Vatican in last year uh, with 20 plus CEOs from the resource industry, uh, which was a deeply moving experience, I thought, but it was interesting to me, maybe you want to explain, Seamus, just this whole notion of a day of reflection, why it's kind of intriguing to have 20 CEOs from the resource industry uh, at the Vatican, and um, just how that whole thing came together and worked. Um, yeah, great to be here, and thanks uh, for the opportunity. Um, let me make, I think, three main points. I think um, from our perspective and my professional life, it's been a good segment of it was very much focused early on on public policy. And I think that was much of the engagement of the Oblates and Mary Macula that you read from earlier, seeing that that was the place where decisions were made affecting the lives of the poor across the world, whether it was Congress, World Bank, IMF, uh, UN, um, you name it. And I think we spent a great deal of time at engaging in that whole public policy conversation. Uh, and that was much, I think, also of the way that the Vatican appreciated how it was going to bring some kind of a moral compass into the conversation, was to engage with governments, uh, to engage with heads of state, which it obviously often does. I think uh, some light bulbs went on probably in the late 70s, early 80s, coming for us certainly out of the, uh, the Latin American debt crisis and the petrodollar uh, excess that was out there. And hearing from folks on the ground in Latin America particularly what the impact of that crisis was having on the lives of people. So that's kind of shifted us over 
uh, to saying, well, we need to have a conversation with the private sector. And our avenue for doing that has been primarily as shareholders. Uh, and most of the work that we've done is through, uh, here in the States is through the uh, Interfaith Center on Corporate Responsibility, which has a 42-year track record starting with the apartheid uh, issues in South Africa and U.S. corporations in their presence there, but has now gone on to a broad range of issues, but has maybe 300 institutional faith-based investors, a number of SRI investors in the room, uh, following the usual process of engaging corporate leaders, um, if necessary, filing stockholder resolutions, attending annual meetings, uh, trying to raise some issues that we think may be missed in the, uh, in the normal operation or a conversation of a company. I, just a, a side note, I think uh, Jamie Dimon felt like he was ambushed 10 days ago at the AGM for uh, J.P. Morgan Chase in Tampa. Uh, there were the three first speakers were Sister Nora Nash, from the Sisters of St. Francis of Philadelphia. She was born in Limerick. And then myself afterwards. And then the next one was Father Jim Conlon, who was born in Cork. So it, at one point, he looked down from the dais and said, now, where did you all come from? <laughs> and uh, what are the, how did you get in front of me like this? So uh, certainly, that was a way in which we felt was an important opportunity to engage. Uh, I think the response, uh, certainly, the, the viewpoint of the Vatican is that they have been receiving more and more uh, input, reflections, letters, commentaries from different places around the world, as Mark alluded to earlier, of where mines operate, of where uh, drilling is going on, whether it's in Peru or in Brazil or in Papua New Guinea or the Congo. And so it's coming to a level on their radar that is saying, well, what is the role of mining? And how much do we actually know about it? And I think. That's why you had uh, somebody like Cardinal Turkson willing to take up the, uh, the invitation, uh, himself coming from a mining background uh, from Ghana, uh, growing up in a mining village. So I think that made him very much open to the conversation. Uh, and I think clearly wanting to say, is there a constructive role for the church and the industry to play together here? So the day of reflection was very much characterized around the opportunity to put on the table what are the issues, what are the concerns, what are the criticisms, what are the terrible things that mining is doing, what are some of the good things that are happening. And a fairly uh, positive, small group kind of conversation uh, around those things uh, with the full recognition that uh, we've now got uh, a Holy Father who is very much pushing the church out into the world again to be open to conversations across a broad range of issues. Uh, with the sense of saying, you know, we need to address these issues together in, in a coalition that's creative in a way that has the common good of the billions that are still left outside of prosperity. So is there a way we can work on that together? And I think uh, the Pope Francis factor has certainly made the Vatican, I think, much more receptive in that regard. Well, that certainly gives us a, a good broad perspective of all the initiatives and the role the Vatican's playing. I think actually pose a question to each, that each of you can answer is that, you know, I mean, we've heard on the panelists before how difficult it is just to change one company, you know, and we've talked about earlier this morning too that many companies actually don't make a transition. Most companies fail in transitions. So how, how do you think, what are the key ingredients do you think from actually making a whole industry shift? Um, without that industry kind of failing and falling on its own sword. So I don't know who wants to tackle that. How do, how do we get a whole industry to kind of move? So which one? Mark, do you want to kick that one off? Yeah. I, I think, um, <coughs> firstly, being able to land the conversation in your own organisation is absolutely critical. And I think uh, we talked about roles of CEOs. I think CEOs are the ones that, that, that have to put a line or draw that line in the sand and start a new conversation. That's the vision thing, I guess. But the CEO's role is, is much more important than just simply the vision thing. If you don't put the structures in place that support those conversations and actually change the routines in the organisation, you won't land change. And so what has to go with that is actually deep structural reform within the business to actually support the vision and the, the direction you're taking. So we've started that on that journey. Consistent with that, in interacting with our peers through something like the ICMM, 
we're interacting at CEO level to CEO level, but we're also we're interacting at the technical levels through the organisations and talking about the things we're doing, and we're encouraging what we call an open technology platform, as you know. Yes. Uh, whether it's in collaborative research, because as a mining industry, not only we're failing on the sustainability side, we're actually failing in terms of application of new technologies. That's why the cost of our products are going up 15% a year, year on year. If we don't change the model, then we literally have failed society. So having those conversations and then taking it forward as an organisation and being seen to be successful. The interesting thing was that when I talked about talking to the Vatican, um, not so much, well, probably some similarities to the Gandhi quote, uh, people laughed, they giggled, and said, why the hell would you want to go, pardon me, Father, <laughs> why would you want to go? <laughs> 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 that's nothing. No, that's nothing. <laughs> so I'm being a bit naughty. No. Um, the, the, why would you want to go to the Vatican? And uh, we said, and when we actually opened the conversation up and talked about 1.6 billion people and talked about the $25 billion in projects that are standing still, there were three or four chief executives very keen on that conversation because they were at the end of their tether in terms of understanding what to do next. And so this dialogue gave them a start. And then we started to get other guys interested who were fascinated in terms of the concept. So I think it's about putting yourself out there. I think it's opening up the dialogue, making the dialogue accessible so that people can understand how it might make a difference. and then leading people in the conversation and from there the conversation will either have merit or substance and it will then grow from there. So at the moment we've got a lot of people interested. We started off with three or four. We ended up getting 20 to the Vatican. I think every one of the people that were at those Vatican sessions came back with a different perspective and I still reflect on two words. Meaningful existence yep. and the conversation around what we do when we go into um, a community and uh, we think about all the houses we may have to relocate or communities that we have to relocate and we sort of think in the hardware perspective. We think about the house, the roads, the power. In many cases they don't have power. And we sort of build these buildings for people to live in but we forget that if we don't actually recreate their ability to have a meaningful existence, that is work, agricultural, however they may choose to live, then at the end of the day we've not created or recreated a meaningful existence, therefore you've got a problem. Yeah. And, and those two words made us think very differently about the models we were using and for us that was the, the learning piece and I think everyone in that room was able to share and discuss those types of issues and so I think that's the sort of thing you have to do to push the industry along. In the end you can create the circumstances where we share and learn together and you take it forward. We take it from there. Yeah, no. I think that whole notion of open dialogue that's accessible to everyone is very important. Yep. Derek, your perspective on this industry right. change, especially with 10,000 companies. Right. Oh my Sorry. God. So. And I enjoyed the presentation on risk, you know, and I think that's a big element of this whole space here. Though. Now we, we talk about the, um, I mean, how difficult it feels to try and lift something with 10,000 companies, but you can think about it the opposite way. That if, if something changes overnight, maybe that the ecosystem disappears. And if it disappears, it will happen within months and not decades, right? So, you know, part of the, you know, when we're facing, you know, what, what might be something that, that could bring prosperity for a generation, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of dialogue needs to happen that just hasn't happened yet. You know, we're only 10 years into this whole space. And, and, and frankly, you know, we've had maybe, it might have been the very first time that the, the diversity of people were in one room in Miami this year. The very first time with only you know, 20 people trying to figure out you know, what are the perspectives that potentially link all of this and, and what are we actually missing. So, you know, and, and ideas can come from anywhere. And I, I really do believe that there, there are some elements that we really don't understand yet that could be part of making this sustainable, not just for the United States, but for areas that are really looking at this in earnest around the, around the world. You know, and I, I, I also think that, you know, you know we, we've made a lot of reference so far about this whole idea about you know, change being difficult, change at scale, but there's a risk associated with if you're not prepared, 
if you're not looking at scenarios, that sometimes change can happen and happen overnight, and you're a company that's been around for 100 years may, may be out of existence, right? So I, I'm, we're, we're still at a, a fairly early stage here, but uh, you know, there's, there's ideation going to come from these conversations, I really believe, that there could be competitive edge for the companies involved and, and could really create you know, sustainable uh, prosperity for you know, the communities and the, the countries that, that can do something effective with it. You know? yeah. that's, so, that's a good perspective because I think that shares with Mark. And I remember, Mark, you said that in Brazil when you kicked off with the opening address that if we as an industry don't act and lead, right. then the change will be imposed on us and we won't like the answer. And I think that's an important, which is that risk factor. The change will happen when it's least wanted, least expected, and it can be very destructive for everybody. I actually said we'd become a subsidiary of GE. GE, exactly. Which we all thought was a good thing. Yeah, it was a good thing, yeah. Well, might enhance your market cap. Seamus, what you, what's your perspective on this? I think um, the other thing that probably we haven't talked about, I, I think there's a key debate going on, and which is where the church comes from, and certainly some of my colleagues come from, on just the whole notion of development. Um, I think lots of folks would now see uh, you know, that development has in many ways become an industry and has maybe lost some of its forward-looking, horizon-seeking uh, vision. Uh, when you think that, you know, we've had, what, seven decades of UN development decades uh, mm -hmm. that, uh, and wrestled with what does that actually mean globally? And we've come up with lots of different uh, conversations about that, ideas, proposals. Maybe we've settled at the moment on sustainable development, but we know at least at the conceptual level that's a hotly debated topic these days, even the word development. And so I think we're at a point where the development industry or the development agencies, whether they're from the public sector or from the private sector, are going to uh, an examination of their own. Uh, and just simply saying, going back to your earlier creative coalitions, well, are we working just with governments? Are we working with local communities? Are we working with multinationals? Uh, are we working with the Africa Development Bank? Or, so uh, I think they're beginning, whereas previously they may have just lined up about going and building schools or building clinics and finding ways to staff them or uh, dry, uh, drilling boreholes for water to bring portable water to a place or developing, uh, delivering uh, mosquito netting uh, to different villages across Africa. I think they, all of those in themselves are very good things. I think the larger question is, if you're building for the long term, what, who are the necessary players that have to be a part of that? And so I think in lots of the development agencies that are out there, there is a, a good opportunity, an openness to examine what kind of partnerships or alliances can come about with industry. And that's perhaps it's a good time for uh, extractives, uh, unconventional oil and gas, because they're in the forefront of many of these uh, places where um, poverty, uh, environmental questions, indigenous are constantly yeah. being put out there. And so it's a good opportunity, I think, for both these sectors to learn from each other. Yeah, no, I think it's important. I think your notion of who the necessary players is key, because one thing we've seen in the last two, three years, I think both industries, it was a much more sim simple world to deal with. And now what we call spheres of influence, there's so many people that are very focused around this and it doesn't matter who they are. And a lot of them aren't in the conversation, but they are influencing world leaders and the people that are mining and oil and gas companies are interacting with. I want to give the audience a chance to ask any, some questions. Yes, gentlemen here. I want to ask about the role of government, or rather lack of it. <coughs> So the, the question is the role of government or the lack of it? So who wants to... I mean, I, I think from our perspective, the role of government has, prim has principally in this area been looking for setting the framework and the principle and the regulation that looks for some uh, opportunity for the achievement of the common good. I mean, in Catholic perspectives, for sure, we've talked about the universal destination of the goods of the earth, which is a very high-minded idea, but I think it boils down much closer to saying, is the government putting in place regulations, laws, uh, frameworks whereby, whether it's access to minerals, access to credit, access to food, is done in an equitable fashion and is willing to hold civil society and corporations responsible for abiding by those frameworks which uh, the citizens hopefully have elected them to put forward. Uh, you can debate how heavy the role of government should be uh, and 
whether they're doing it effectively, and that could take us all night, of course, but yes. that's my general sense of that's what they're all discussion role is. for the bar, I think. <laughs> yeah. Derek, Mark, do you want to have a shot at that? Yeah, no, I, but I, I actually think it's unreasonable for governments to understand enough of the depth of the, the, the challenges we're facing in some of these industrial sectors to make you know, any kind of conscious decision on what the framework should actually be in some cases. So there's more of a burden of responsibility following the corporations today like to help to help you know, put in place what these development frameworks might actually look like, but the governments have to be part of the table. Sure. Now, they absolutely have to be there to understand the dynamics of you know, whatever's happening in the local areas, but, but the depth associated from a, a tech standpoint or a, a commerce standpoint is just so broad, even within individual companies today, that it's unreasonable to think that governments could ever have the expertise to do that. And I, there's some great examples in our space where we, we had somebody you know, coin the phrase, there's a, a reindustrialization of the United States going on in front of our eyes today. And it's making people nervous. And it's happening in a, a, a very uncoordinated way. Now we have 10,000 companies that are essentially, you know, having us and companies like us drill wells, and it's happened on people's properties. You know, it's happening on areas of, of farmland. And it's happening in a way that, frankly, you know, the, the, the state can't properly regulate, and that there's no federal regulations. So when we're, we're looking at something that, that could be here for the next generation, then there's a responsibility falling back somehow on industry to say, you know, here's how you should coordinate this. And in one area, in any one basin, there might be a few hundred to a thousand companies actually working. They might not just be drilling for wells, they need midstream infrastructure, pipelines to take it from one place to somewhere else. And, and all this is going on in a pretty haphazard way today. You know, so there's a, you know, and companies like us don't have the responsibility for that directly ourselves either. So we can't do it without having, you know, the, all the right people in the room to try and think through what these development frameworks might look like in order for some cases that might end up in regulations and you know, been helping governments do this. So. Mark. <coughs> I think one of the biggest, I think one of the biggest, if not the biggest challenge for governments is the ability to attract and build the deep level of talent that you need to be on the edge of and, and effective in these rapidly changing environments. And the major corporations, even the smaller corporations, and I think Anna's conversation about the different orbits, um, the expertise, or generally the expertise, is more likely to sit in industry. So I think the role of governments is changing. Uh, and those that are most successful in development have worked out or are looking at how they utilise and facilitate the involvement in the private sector in finding solutions to major problems. And if you look in Africa at the moment, the most successful governments are those that have tapped into the private sector. And for example, in Ghana, um, the project management of the most significant malaria reduction program in the world has been given to a mining company. Now the Gates Foundation provided $130 million support and said, as a point of principle, we don't give money to governments, we give it to the private sector. So the Ghanaian government and the Gates Foundation came together and, and approached us, this is a few years back, and said, look, you've run the most successful malaria control program on the continent. Will you manage this for us as a country? Of course we said yes, you couldn't say no. And those governments that I think can facilitate and support and tap that expertise, that deep technical expertise that sits in our organisation, it may even be in the church in terms of social development, are the ones that I think will provide the best solutions and, and, and get to those solutions probably quicker than most. And, and certainly that's what we're seeing in the field. Absolutely. And I think yeah, government's got a challenge to get their heads around that for sure. Other questions? Got a, uh, time for a few more? Yeah, Mike, and then we'll, somewhere up there. I see a hand. Next after Mike, you go. Sure. Derek, do you want to? Yeah, no, I'd, well, we, you know, in, in a space of one day with the 20 plus people we had there, I, I haven't actually seen as rich content produced than, than that. I mean, seriously, we had a, you know, a wonderful set of things that could easily be you know, industry sponsored initiatives in their own right. Sure. The, uh, the interesting thing that, that came out of it was almost everybody was like, how do we action it? Who's going to lead the program? What should we do? You know, 
we put names against the, uh, and I, I honestly think that's the wrong thing to do. Now, if you're looking at programs that might take decades, then you need to let the whole conversation settle, really look at this and think, you know, is, is that really going to work? And now when you look at it in a cold light of day, there's something going, like, ah, I, I was in the moment and loved it, but coming back a bit, I still think there's some work to do. So we're, we're, we've purposely taken a, a step to say, let's reshape it again. We're going to have some new people, some of the same people, you know, here in a couple of weeks' time. And I think over the course of this first year, have a better look at what some of the critical elements of that framework really, really should be. You know, so we're, we're, we're on the journey. I think it's okay that we feel like it is a journey and not something that, you know, there's no personal agenda, there's no company agenda here. It really is you know, something that, if you want to change the reputation of an industrial sector that's taken 50 years to get where it's at, that ain't going to happen in, 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 in six months, right? So we're, um, you know, we're taking the first uh, steps there. One of the things that kind of gets in the way a little bit is that when we talk about 10,000 companies, there are at least 5,000 initiatives. So almost everybody is just so fatigued in the space that well, why should we bet on, on this one? What's different about this one? You know, the one that I've been involved in for two years, I'm kind of comfortable with it, and it, it's affected my little ecosystem fine, so I, 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 I don't want to do any more. So there really is a fatigue in this whole space that there's reluctance to get involved in something that might feel like ball in the ocean when you, when you step into it. So the, I mentioned right at the start that I think one of the challenges is going to be these, uh, you know, the search for the missing links, as I call it, right? It's the, uh, you know, what might influence a generation but can be linked back to making business better today. And I don't think we've really, you know, we've not really understood exactly what those things are yet, Mike. Yeah, I think so the, I would say that I think two things uh, very quickly. I think I thought it was a great leap of faith in terms of the mining industry to actually open themselves to conventionally in the religious tradition a day of reflection, which means some input is offered. Uh, at this point, it was by the Pontifical Council, uh, and that kind of there were no holds barred. They brought people in from Malaysia, from uh, South America, uh, from. Uh, you know, di different business schools, and where there was an environment and a, a space of trust there where there was a willingness to say, you know, these are the issues, and these are some of the ways in which we might be able to address those. So from that point of view, I thought on part of the industry, it was a great leap of faith to put themselves into that space uh, and to be, I think, good listeners and uh, respectful responders to what they were hearing because not everything that they were hearing was factually bad enough. Or comfortable, but <laughs> Mark, anything to add? Yeah, yeah. I think I think it was a very, <coughs> a very important session, and not so much for the framework that we agreed, because I think we made progress on getting to that type of conversation. But I think we still got a long way to go. It was actually the dialogue, and it was the sincerity of the conversation. And I think Cardinal Turkson said it very well when he said, this is a process. This is about learning about each other and in time influencing the way we lead the industry and it will be a different industry. Uh, we have a project, and John Samuel's done a key part of the work, where we've now got a problem with a project we're developing in Peru and there are three major projects on hold because of local community issues. Our problem is the local community wants it built yesterday. And the federal government's approved it. It's gonna take us another 18 months. So the risk we've got at the moment is we're not gonna be able to move quick enough for the community. And that, that involved a couple of engagement sessions that were very successful. So we're learning and it's getting better, but it's the engagement, it's the conversation, it's the ability to engage in a very different way um, and being open to what the outcomes may be. And I think that's the difference, and, and so it's a journey. Thanks. Unfortunately, we've got no more time. The clock is um, it's red, and I'm not colour blind. So uh, just some wrap-up comments. I think, actually, an anecdote for you. Uh, one of the ladies that we've had, and this was a big epiphany for me, is a petite housewife from Pennsylvania, Emily Craftjack. High school educated, but could toe-to-toe uh, -to -toe with any technical person uh, at our thing in Miami on fracking. She knew every detail. And she has started, she has two wells on her property. She's pro fracking, but in a way that's responsible. She started a not for profit, cogent, that will represent communities. You know, it's hard to argue with somebody that's representing the person on the ground. Nobody likes it, is her comment. 
The oil and gas companies don't like me because I hold their feet to the fire because I don't think they treat me with trust and respect. The NGOs, I tell them they are barking up the wrong tree. They're dealing with issues that are not the key in issues for the community. They're dealing with issues that are of an interest to their financial sponsors. And the government, you're either regulating too much or you're not doing enough. So, and you know, she's in congressional hearing. So the, the person on the ground who's being impacted the most is a very powerful voice. And I think nobody can argue with her. So some things I think we've heard today, obviously, is and consistent, I think, throughout this afternoon. The CEO, CEO role is important. And to change an industry, you need to change an organization one at a time. And soon a competitive advantage will be seen. And hopefully, you'll move the other in, rest of the industry by example. Um, I think the search for the missing links it's kind of the search for the holy grail, hopefully not. Um, and that's really bounded by you know, this common language. I mean, both at the Vatican and in all these sessions, it takes time to get everybody to speak from a, uh, in a common language and not talk at cross purposes with each other and also build up trust in the process, which is very important. You know, when uh, Derek says, uh, jokingly, energy is a foreign language, it really, really is. Um, so we've got to be careful there. I think this comment of a meaningful existence uh, I think it's a very powerful notion in doing things in a faith-based way, in a responsible way. Um, and the recognition that we, um, you know, we don't have all the answers, we have to do it collectively. And I think we've heard a lot about public-private partnerships this afternoon. I, again, I don't, there's two things that I'd like to leave you with. One is, it's not just the role of government. Uh, they've got to build a, a capability and a muscle, if you like, to do things in a public-private partnership. Everything we've talked about is bring all the stakeholders together. And in the mining industry, the representative from the UN said, the people that have to be at the center of doing this has to be the corporation. It's not the UN, it's not the NGO. Um, but the government has to be at the table and working, and everything has to be done in partnership and in a collaborative way. And that's sometimes difficult for a lot of governments to uh, appreciate and to act upon that. And the other one at the end of the day is, you know, these you know, mineral development, uh, oil and gas, these are vital to global prosperity. And if you look at it through economic, social, environmental, and geopolitical security lens, the thing I find is each constituent is weighed too heavily around one of those lenses. We need a balancing. These are too important for us to say it must be shut down or we're going to go hell for leather, you know, no matter what. So we need a balanced approach that addresses each of those four lenses uh, to enable society to have a prosperous future. Uh, and that's economic, social, and environmental future. So uh, with that, I think... I'm over two minutes, so not too long between drinks. So uh, please thank uh, Mark, Derek, and Seamus. Thank you, Peter, and thank you to the panel. I, I just want to underscore something. It's, it's really hard to convey this in a panel or any sort of speaking format, but I participated in, as a facilitator. This was really Peter and Mark's show. In Brazil at the main kickoff session for the mining initiative two years ago, and there are a couple things that don't come across in a room like this. One is, these aren't people sitting around saying, oh, let's just get a little better, let's collaborate, and everything's going to be fine, and hey, keep up the good work, buddy, send me a check. There are tough conversations in these, in these rooms. And I heard that people from the church, they laid it out. Some of the mining leaders weren't ready to hear some of it. But it was a safe space where they did have those conversations. And I heard those very challenging situations discussed in Brazil. And, and that was energizing, exciting to see, and to see that people stayed in the room and they stuck with it and they said, we've got to figure this stuff out. As Mark Kudafani says many times, if we don't change the rules, somebody else is going to do it to us and we don't want that to happen. The second thing that doesn't come across as much as it should is how unusual these conversations are. And, where, and I miss that. Because, oh, okay, so we have a few people from a faith-based organization, a couple NGOs, uh, uh, someone from First Nations, a professor, gosh knows what he's doing there. And they all got together and they talked about this stuff. But at the end of the program in Brazil, the president of Oxfam USA, Ray Offenheiser, and the lead for UN Habitat in Brazil, Eric... Christensen. Right, Eric Christensen stood up. They were sitting together, I think, for protection, to protect each other mutually. They stood up, NGO leaders from global organizations, and they said, you know what? In our collective 35 years, 40 years in this, in this space, this is the first time I've ever had a substantive conversation with leaders from the mining industry, period. And that's why these people are here, and that's why they continue to come back. Thanks a lot to this group.